Um, when, uh, when superpowers were given out, uh, I'm afraid I was at the back of the queue. Uh, and uh, the memory superpower, which I'd hoped to get, I wasn't issued with. Um, therefore, I have this little black book, and this little black book comes with me everywhere, and it's got notes about what I'm going to say to people. So I reserve the right to refer to it this evening, but they, uh, earlier on this evening, I thought I'll just have a bit of a look in the, the little black book and uh, make sure that I, uh, I've got some idea of what I'm going to say to you. Because without the book, the talk would not be a TED talk, it would be a mega TED talk. We would be here for about four and a half hours. Uh, with me telling stories, getting over excited. So the book is important. And I flipped open the book to check the, the facts and check the, the stories that I was going to tell. And uh, to my surprise, the book flopped open at a page about a gentleman called Alexander Grant. Now, you may not know about Alexander Grant. Alexander Grant, uh, in the year um, 19 or 1892, I should say, um, a young man from Forest. Uh, invented the digestive biscuit uh, and uh, became enormously wealthy, uh, had a wonderful life. And uh, you're very lucky that I'm not going to tell you the story of Alexander Trump this evening <laughs> because uh, I discovered to my relief rather than my horror that I had the right book, just the wrong page. So, uh, so we're on the, uh, on the trail of the real Macbeth page now. Um, and uh, to help me, I have the shade of, of the real Macbeth. Um, I moved to uh, the town of Forres uh, 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago. Um, Forres is one of the oldest towns in Scotland. For me as a historian uh, and a, a professional career in tourism and heritage, this was good news. This is fabulous. This is a really interesting place. Um, and of course, Shakespeare's Macbeth is associated with Forres. Let me have a show of hands. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of, have ever read or have uh, ever seen Shakespeare's play Macbeth? There we go. That's virtually everybody in the room. It's, it's one of the most famous pieces of drama uh, on the planet. Uh, Macbeth, the character, one of the most powerful, best-known uh, anti-heroes uh, in uh, dramatic literature. Very, very famous. So I was quite excited. I'm going to live in a place that's associated with Macbeth. Um, and uh, we, we telegraphed the story a little bit, but imagine my surprise when uh, I spoke to people in Forest, excited about this connection, uh, said to them, isn't it fabulous, this connection between Macbeth and Forest? And people looked at me oddly, and they said, you mean Macbeth's the butcher. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I said, no, I, I mean Macbeth as in Shakespeare's Macbeth. And people's reaction really surprised me. They said, that was just a play. Really, Cameron, you know, be serious. Um, he wasn't real, that was just a story. And Macbeth wasn't just a story, Macbeth was, was a real man. Um, and that intrigued me about why, why people seem to have lost part of their history. Because history, if you think about it, history is what we remember. History is things that are remembered. Um, so that set me off on a, a journey of discovery with some colleagues into uh, uh, the, the trail of the real Macbeth, the world of the real Macbeth. And history doesn't just live in archives. History lives in books, it lives in art, it lives in artifacts in museums, uh, and it lives in the landscape. It lives in actual places. So when we embarked on this journey, going to the uh, the actual landscapes and places that were associated with, with the real Macbeth or with Shakespeare's story um, was important to us beginning to build up a picture of, of what the real Macbeth was all about, what was this story. And it led to a book, it led to a, a video documentary, and it did indeed uh, lead to me almost being arrested. Um, and in order for you to concentrate on the rest of what I'll say, I'll tell you that story right now. Um, uh, I was in Forres, um, walking along Forres High Street, on my way to give a talk about the real Macbeth and to share this excitement of, isn't this fun and fabulous, this real man? Um, and I had with me this helmet, so the shade of Macbeth was with me. I was also carrying a shield, I was carrying a sword, and I was carrying a long-handled axe. <laughs> uh, and I was trudging along Forres High Street, 
I noticed, to my horror, that parked on the side of the road was a police car with four members of the constabulary sitting in the car, open-mouthed, looking out the window. Um, and uh, the, the windows wound down, electronic windows. Both windows beside me wound down at the same time, and the police officer leaned out, said, excuse me, sir, you do realize that you're walking down Forest High Street with a sword, an axe, a shield, and a helmet? And ever quick-witted, I said, yes, thank you, and walked on. <laughs> but you could see in their faces, one of them wanted to arrest me. Three thought that was quite funny. So, um, let me give you a, a whistle-stop um, tour then through, uh, through the life and times of the real Macbeth. You'll be tested on the dates at the end. There's lots of dates. It's history. It's, it's, it's all about dates. So let me take you back to round about the year 1000. And in the year 1000, um, uh, the province of Murray was much bigger than the modern county of Murray. The province of Murray stretched from beyond the Spey to way beyond Inverness. It was a huge swathe of the northern part of what was called Alba at the time. Scotland didn't even exist uh, as we know it today. It was called Alba. So there's this enormous agricultural, very powerful province. The basis of power was agriculture. Uh, that's what generated surplus. That's what fed people. That's what made you successful. And the province of Murray was this fabulously successful frontier province, because to the north of us, across the Murray Firth, are the Vikings. That's the Viking world. That world looks at Scandinavia. Um, so we're, we're at the outer limits of, of Alba. We're a very powerful province. And the province is ruled by a man called a Mormaer. The modern equivalent is an earl. He's a sub-king. He's a very, very important man. In the near 1000, his name is Finlay. And his wife is called Doada. And Doada is the king of Alba's daughter. So these are important people. This is the ruler of one of the most powerful provinces in Alba. And he's married to the king's daughter. And then round about the year 1005, um, they had a son. Hooray, congratulations. And they decided to call their son Macbeth Macfinley in Gaelic, because at the time, the province of Murray was Gaelic speaking. Called their son Macbeth Macfinley. Macbeth, son of Finlay. Macbeth is the Gaelic for Macbeth. So Macbeth, son of Finlay. So our hero, our young hero, was born around about the year 1005. He's not the upstart that Shakespeare portrays. In Shakespeare's Macbeth, Macbeth comes from nowhere. Uh, he, um, uh, he gains advancement, and then everything goes terribly wrong. Macbeth was born into the aristocracy. He was born quite important. And because of the nature of kingship at the time, he was born with a legitimate claim to the kingship of Alba. So the boy was born and could have been king. And we'll see what happens a little bit later in the story. So he wasn't an upstart. Um, he was a member of the, uh, the aristocracy, a member of the royalty, however you want to put it. It's an important young man. Now, people at the time had a very, very sensible idea. And what they used to do with teenagers, on the whole, was send them to somebody else's house to, do, to learn, to develop skills, and just to get them out of the way. Because you know what teenagers are like, particularly teenage boys. Go and learn in somebody else's household. And Macbeth, because of his connections, he would have gone to the king's household. That's his granddad. He'd have gone there to learn the skills that he would need later in life uh, to become a ruler. So off he goes to the, the king's household, and there he grows up with at least two other young men. One of them is called Duncan. We'll meet Duncan later. And one of them is called Thorfinn. Duncan comes from Dunkeld, um, and Thorfinn comes from Orkney. Thorfinn is the son of the Earl of Orkney. Um, so the King of Alba, through marriages of his daughters to various parts of, uh, parts of the country, he's trying to bind it together. So these three young men are cousins, Duncan, Macbeth, and Thorfinn, and they grow up in the king's household. Life is good. They grow up as friends, no doubt, but also as 
potential rivals in the future. Um, so life is going great, but in the year 1020, everything goes horribly, terribly, tragically wrong for Macbeth. Because Macbeth's father, Finlay, who we met earlier, Finlay the Murmur of Murray, is murdered. And he's murdered by um, two of Macbeth's other cousins. This is the story of cousins fighting wars. Um, and they take over control of the province of Murray. So Macbeth, there he is in the king's household, he's lost almost everything. He's lost what no doubt he thought was his birthright. He certainly lost his father, and he may well have lost his mother at the same time. It was a barbaric age. Regime change would take place suddenly and very decisively. So there's Macbeth, near 1020, he's in the king's household, and he stays there. And he, he grows, uh, grows up there, doubtless harboring resentment at these people who took control of the province that he'd hoped one day to, to rule, uh, embittered about the, the murder of his, his father. But he grows to become one of Alba's principal war leaders. He's mentioned in the Chronicles of the Time. Um, so he becomes an important man. So roll the clock forward a bit to the year 1032. And in 1032, the man who murdered Macbeth's father and took control of the province of Murray is mysteriously trapped in a house. And he and all of his followers, almost all of his followers, um, are killed. Regime change again. And the finger of suspicion points directly at Macbeth. Doubly so, because in 1032, hey presto, Macbeth becomes more mayor of Murray. So he recovers his birthright. And he takes control of this, this area where we are now. Uh, this was, in effect, Macbeth's sub-kingdom, part of Alba. So he ruled here. I said almost all uh, of his predecessor followers were killed in the mysterious fire. Um, one of them, one very important one we know, survived. In 1033, Macbeth gets married. Hooray, congratulations, Macbeth. He gets married to a, a young lady called Gruach. Gruach is a granddaughter of a previous king of Alba. She's a, a royal princess. Um, Gruach also happens to be the widow of the man that Macbeth killed. And imagine that conversation. You know that unfortunate business with your husband. Gilly Comgain, he was called. You know, with Gilly. I may have had something to do with it. I don't know, I can't remember, but it's all terrible. It's in the past. But by the way, shall we get married? And what was that all about? And you think, well, surely that must have been a political match. And maybe it was a little bit. But they were married for 24 years. Shakespeare portrays this self-destructive couple uh, with everything happening really quickly. Um, actually, they were married for 24 years. And if they didn't love each other at the start, surely, to goodness, after 24 years, they must have found a way just to bump along together. So then roll the, the clock forward one more year, 1034, disaster again. King of Alba dies. Nobody killed him, which is unusual in Scottish history. He just sort of dies, gets old, falls ill, he dies. Kingship at that time, kingship a thousand years ago, was not hereditary. Kingship was based on whichever member of a number of rival families was most powerful, most ruthless, best connected, and luckiest. So Duncan, Macbeth, and Thorfinn, who grew up together to become rivals, friends who might become rivals, in 1034, they really were rivals. Duncan won that particular race to the throne. In 1034, Duncan became King of Alba. So there's Macbeth, poor Macbeth, resentful again, thinking, well, Duncan's got this, I, I should have been king. Um, now, bear in mind, this is a barbaric age, um, and uh, a Celtic, a tribal, um, very warlike time. It was incumbent on a new king to go off, pick a fight with with another country or another province, anybody would do really, win the fight, steal everything of value, go back home. Everybody happy. He's a good king, he's good in a fight. Um, so off Duncan went um, and laid siege to Durham. Nice place, rich place. We'll go to Durham. 
And unfortunately, he was unsuccessful there. Um, he was beaten. Uh, his army had to retreat. And his credibility would have gone bump down a bit. Maybe he's not such a good king. Then he looked northwards, and he thought, well, Thorfinn, my cousin Thorfinn, and all of his Scandinavian, Arcadian, Viking barbarians, that uh, we'll go and pick a fight with them. So he sent an army northwards. An army went to Caithness. Disaster. It was defeated. So Duncan's credibility goes down a bit further. Then he thinks, this is just nonsense. My credibility really is going down. People around the country are grumbling about whether I'm a good king or not. I'll lead the army myself. That will guarantee success. So he leads an army up um, to pick a fight with his cousin Thorfinn, and he loses, and he almost loses his life. And the country, Alba, began to, uh, to get very restive. And we know that because in the year 1040, and you will be tested on the dates later, in the year 1040, Duncan brings an army to Murray to pick a fight with Macbeth, either because he thinks, OK, I can't beat Thorfinn, I can't do anything in Durham. Macbeth's a big softy, we'll pick a fight with him. Or Macbeth is an open rebellion. Whatever the reason, in August 1040, the Chronicles tell us, Duncan and his war band came to Murray to pick a fight with Macbeth. And to cut a very long story short, uh, a battle took place at Pitgaveny near Elgin. Um, Duncan was mortally wounded and was taken to Elgin, where he died, and the way was then clear for Macbeth to claim the kingship of Alba. So far from being the, the upstart that, Macbeth, uh, that Shakespeare portrays, this madman who murdered a kindly old king in his house, it was a battle fought between two cousins, and Macbeth had a legitimate claim to the, the kingship. And he didn't rule a chaotic Scotland for just a few weeks, which is how Shakespeare portrays it. He ruled Alba for 17 years, he ruled Alba until 1057. And the chronicles of the time say that he was a good king, actually. Uh, the way they describe it is there were productive seasons. And for an agricultural economy, that's what you want. That's the measure of success. There was peace and prosperity, and people were able to get on with their lives. So Macbeth and Gruach, Lady Macbeth, as Shakespeare would have it, were very successful in their kingship. And that's a complete contrast to what Shakespeare tells us. Um, the marriage of Macbeth and Gruach, Lady Macbeth, took place in 1033. We don't know where that, that wedding took place. However, near Elgin, there's a beautiful little uh, church, Burnley Kirk, it's called. The building that, that stands today was built in the 12th century but it is on a very, very ancient site. It was a Pictish monastery, times past. And that sense of place, you know the sense of place when you go somewhere and you think, um, a really strong sense of place there. And inside the church, there's a Celtic bell. It's called a Ronald bell. And that bell is contemporary with Macbeth. And it's so tempting when you go to the, uh, when you go to the church to look at the bell, to enjoy that sense of place, and to think, well, did that bell ring for the marriage of Macbeth and Gruach? Um, and possibly it did. But you've got to say possibly, because that's not a fact. It's simply part of that uh, piece of historical imagination. But it's such a powerful thing to, to be able to do. Um, and history. I believe that good history is about remembering us individually remembering things, or it's society, culture, remembering what happened in the past. Good history is about remembering. And when in Shakespeare's Macbeth, I think it's Act 3, um, in Shakespeare's Macbeth, very early on, Banquo and Macbeth are trudging through what we're supposed to believe is the middle of nowhere, and Banquo asks, how far is it called to forest? How far away is forest? Bit of a whinger, Banco. How far is it to Forest? Um, and the fact that Forest is the very first place that's mentioned um, in Shakespeare's Macbeth is, is a remembrance of a past importance, because it did used to be a very important place. On the hilltop, on Clooney Hill, beside the, 
the 12th century medieval town of Forest, Versha Hillfort. That Hillfort is contemporary with Macbeth's period. It encompasses an area of about eight acres, by powerful hill fort. It was a number of hill forts uh, around the province of Murray. And the more mayor, the ruler, would have travelled from place to place. So our boy Macbeth would have been on Clooney Hill in the forest. So there's a remembrance of that in Shakespeare's play. But the, the personalities of, and the characters of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth in Shakespeare's play these enormously powerful dramatic characters. There's absolutely nothing in the contemporary records that tell us what the characters were like. Their characters are not remembered in Shakespeare's Macbeth, they're created. And poor old Banquo, one of the most famous roles in Macbeth, uh, poor old Banquo never existed. There was no contemporary reference to him whatsoever. He was created as a literary device or by a later historian thinking, well, there's somebody missing in this part of the story, I'll invent somebody and let's call him Banco. He was an invented character. Which must come as a terrible shock to his ghost, actually, in the play, that he didn't exist. So history is what we, as a, as a society, as individuals, as a culture, is what we remember. Drama is something that we create. And there's a difference between those two history and drama. Um, Shakespeare's uh, play Macbeth is an absolutely magnificent piece of drama, compelling characters, some of the finest characters in literature. Um, but those characters are created. Um, and I think that our, uh, our young man, McBay McFinley, uh, and uh, his wife, Gruach, so Macbeth, and Lady Macbeth, um, I think deserve to be remembered alongside the characters that Shakespeare created in his wonderful play. Thank you very much. <laughs>